She also tried to downplay this AP report that came out that claimed that half of her non-government meetings when she was Secretary of State were with people who had made donations and sizable donations at that to the Clinton Foundation. House Oversight Committee member Trey Gowdy joins us now. Good morning, sir. Good to have you back on the program. She says it's Thank smoke, uh, but there is no fire here. Your thoughts? No, it's, it's arson. Um, it, it's pyromania. It's, it's not smoke, Arthur, where every single thing she said proved to be false. Uh, that's the interesting thing about credibility and believability. You can't just keep it in one compartment. When you are a habitual serial liar in this facet of life, it tends to make people not believe you in other facets of life. So when she's talking about the Clinton Foundation, I go back and remember her saying there's no classified information. I only use one device. Uh, I did it for convenience, all of which were proven to be false. Yeah. I don't see what the smoke is. It seems the only people that really had access to her is if you gave money. I, I doubt well, you could get in no to see her when she was Secretary of State unless you donated. <laughs> That's right. Well, if this is normal behavior, then we certainly don't want more of it. I mean, think about it. If, if you were a Secretary of State and, uh, and you were going to engage in, in pay to play, what would you do? Uh, you would try to cover your tracks. And hence, you see all these deleted emails um, and, and all this subterfuge. I feel sorry for Donna Brazil and the people who have to try to defend this because they know it's not right. But here's the, here's the real thing to think about. If you have all of these irregular, irregularities going on and she's Secretary of State, what will happen if she is president? Just imagine that. ...has been shocked by the continuing revelations regarding Hillary Clinton and her pay-for-play State Department and other things. As I've said many times in recent days, it's hard to tell where the Clinton Foundation ends and where the State Department begins. That's what's happened. The emails which were exposed by WikiLeaks revealed a very strong bias on the part of high officials in the Democratic Party for the candidacy of Hillary Clinton and a very strong prejudice on the part of the same people towards the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. Even though such bias and prejudice had been alleged by Sanders and denied by the Democratic National Committee. It even resulted in the resignation of the chair of the committee as a result of a unanimous request from the members of the committee and the intervention of President Obama himself. But in order to get this issue off the front page, the DNC and the Clinton campaign decided to blame, of all people, the Russians. They accused Vladimir Putin of being in cahoots with Donald Trump and having his intelligence services hack the DNC to expose emails to make Mrs. Clinton look bad and thereby benefit Donald Trump. But the Russians had nothing to do with it because this week a 30-year veteran of the National Security Administration, the NSA, the domestic spies who spy on all of us all the time. The former high-ranking NSA official who developed the software that the NSA now uses, which allows it to capture not just metadata, but content of every telephone call, text message, email in the United States of every person in the United States of America. This individual said, guess what? The NSA hacked the Democratic National Committee. Why would the NSA hack the DNC? Because the members of the intelligence community simply do not want Hillary Clinton to be president of the United States because she doesn't know how to handle state secrets. Because some of the state secrets that she revealed use the proper true names of American intelligence agents operating undercover in the Middle East. When they lost their covers, they ran for their lives, and some of them didn't run fast enough and lost their lives. It's very telling that the intelligence community would feel so strongly about Mrs. Clinton that they would attempt to sabotage her campaign to prevent her from becoming their boss. It's also telling that these folks would break American law in order to, in their view, save it. Welcome to my channel. The lesson for all of us, there is no privacy in this world. Hackers can get into your system. You can be tape recorded at any time by anybody. You can be photographed without your knowledge and people can even listen to your private conversations while you're in your home using technology. What an awful situation.
Teddy Roosevelt once said, Behind the ostensible government sits enthroned an invisible government owing no allegiance and acknowledging no responsibility to the people. John Baum. The director of the FBI, although I disagree with his conclusion, I believe she should have been indicted. I agree with his findings which is that she was extremely careless in handling top secret information. And now we are being asked to elect as our president someone who is extremely careless in handling national security information? Do they think we're stupid? Yes, yes, they do. The Clintons have always thought we were stupid. And Bill, you give the money back for all those speaking fees from the misogynists who paid them to you. What a bunch of phonies. Wow. You, you literally, as I analyze this with these new revelations day after day after day, you literally can't tell where the Clinton Foundation ends and the Justice Department begins. <laughs> Not this Justice Department, because this Justice Department is a disgrace. But well, one of the big questions here, she said she separated out the personal emails. But one thing we don't have a definitive answer to is whether or not she considered foundation business to be personal. So did she dump all of the foundation related emails with the yoga and the wedding plans? Well, Martha, you just put your finger on the, uh, not the million dollar question, the hundred million dollar question. Um, I, I'm sure she's going to have a press conference later this afternoon or whenever she has the next one. I hope somebody in your line of work will ask her, did you consider foundation emails to be personal or work related? I have yet to see a single foundation email produced by the State Department that was sent, to, uh, sent by her. Yeah. So if she considered them to be personal, then we move into the facet where she and her lawyers had those emails deleted. And, and they didn't just push the delete button, they had them deleted where even God can't read them. They were using something called bleach bit. You don't use bleach bit for yoga emails or for bridesmaids emails. Mm -hmm raises the question, what if it turns out, and, and this is actually what Clinton and her lawyer have said, the server has been scrubbed clean and any of those 30,000 emails that she destroyed that she said were about yoga lessons and Chelsea's wedding, what if they're not available? What does that tell you? Well, I'll tell you what it tells you, Chris. I don't know whether you do yoga or not. I don't, so I don't have any yoga emails, but, but the greater steps that you take clean something or or delete something that's a higher level of concealment that that's a higher level of consciousness of concealment so your viewers have to ask themselves to what links would they go to delete a yoga email would they call in forensic experts to triple wash a server so they could get rid of bridesmaids emails or yoga practice emails of course not take a look do you think the Chinese and or the Russians are reading your emails? The answer so. is, uh, it is very likely. Uh, it is not without, you know, outside the realm of possibility. Question, uh, Congressman, when the Inspector General for the Intelligence Committee says that on these private emails was information that came from satellite intercepts, imagery, or electronic surveillance, and you've got John Kerry saying it's very likely that foreign powers are reading his emails, does that raise the stakes here? Uh, absolutely. It was one of the most reckless decisions that have been made in, 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 in public service in a long time. Professor Gruber, uh, what did you mean when you said they proposed it and that passed because the American people are too stupid to understand the difference? When I said that, I was at a conference being glib and quite frankly trying to make myself, make myself seem smart by insulting others. Are you offering the venue as a defense uh, for, uh, for saying it or for meaning it? I'm offering it as a defense for using inappropriate and hurtful and excusable language to explain. Well, what did you mean by too stupid to understand the difference? Congressman, I didn't mean anything about it by it. Well, you said it. You had to admit it.
I was once again being glib and trying to make myself seem smarter by reflecting. Well, what other. did you mean when you said it was a very basic exploitation of the lack of economic understanding of the American voter? What did you mean by that? Once again, it's another example of my inexcusable arrogance and trying to insult others to make myself seem smarter. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan. If you've got health insurance, you can keep it. If you like your health care plan, you will keep it your plan. If you've got health insurance, you like your doctor, you like your plan, you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan. If you have insurance that you like, then you will be able to keep that insurance. If you like your doctor or health care plan, you can keep it. If you're happy with what you got, nobody's changing. So, Madam Secretary, uh, regardless of where he ranked in the order of advisors, um, it is undisputed that a significant number of your emails uh, were to or from a Sidney Blumenthal. Now, he did not work for the State Department. He didn't work for the U.S. government at all. Uh, he wanted to work for the State Department, but the uh, White House said no to him. Do you recall who specifically at the White House rejected Sidney Blumenthal? No, I do not. After he was turned down for a job at the State Department by the White House, he went to work where? I, I think he had a number of uh, consulting contracts with different uh, entities. Well, if he had a number of them, do you recall any of them? I know that he did some work for my husband. Well, he worked for the Clinton Foundation. That's, uh, that's correct. Okay. Still don't have electricity or BlackBerry coverage post Irene, so I've had to resort to my new iPad. Now, before you give Mr. Blumenthal too much credit, uh, you, you agree he didn't write a single one of those cables or memos he sent you. I'm sorry, what? He didn't write a single one of those cables or memos. I, I don't know who wrote them. He's the one who sent them to me. W would you be surprised to know not a single one of those was from him? I, I don't know where he got the information that he did was uh, did you sending ask? to me. Did you, did you ask? You're sending me very specific, detailed intelligence. What is your source? That well, seems to me like a pretty good question. I, I did learn later that he was talking to or sharing uh, information from uh, former American intelligence officials. By the name of? Who wrote those cables? I don't recall. I don't know, uh, Mr. Chairman. But here's another possible explanation that may give us a sense of why maybe the White House didn't want you to hire him in the first place. In one email, he wrote this about the President's Secretary of Defense. I infer Gates' problem is losing an internal debate. Tyler, and by the way, Tyler is Tyler Drumheller. That's who actually authored the cables that you got from Mr. Blumenthal. Tyler knows him well but, and says he's a mean, vicious little, I'm not going to say the word, but he did. This is a, an email from Blumenthal to you about the President, Secretary of Defense. And here's another Blumenthal email to you about President's National Security Advisor, frankly, Tom Donlan's babbling rhetoric about narratives on a phone briefing of reporters on March the 10th has inspired derision among foreign, serious foreign policy analysts, both here and abroad. And here's another one from uh, what you say is your old friend, Sidney Blumenthal. This is a quote from him. I would say Obama, and by the way, he left the president part out. I would say Obama appears to be intent on seizing defeat from the jaws of victory. He and his political cronies in the White House in Chicago are, to say the least, unenthusiastic about regime change in Libya. Obama's lukewarm and self-contradicting statements have produced what is, at least for the moment, operational Paralysis. Come out days later promising that you'll keep her on as attorney general if you become president. You're right. We're fed up with your kind of government where the destruction of subpoenaed evidence with hammers and bleach pit and delete buttons are tolerated. Where you simply ignore subpoenas and you destroy federal documents. Where the head of the FBI, when called upon to explain before Congress why you're not being charged with a myriad of federal felonies, is so outclassed and so outlawed that a five year old could write an indictment based upon federal crimes? Hillary, you are a liar and a pathological one at that. You're a cheat. You're dishonest, you are condescending, you are arrogant, contemptuous, and if you think that your half-assed apology will wipe the slate clean, you are wrong. You could put 
half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Diagnose her campaign. Mm -hmm. And we'll look what we, look, 2005, she faints before a speech. 09, she falls and breaks her elbow. 2011, falls boarding the airplane. 2012, falls, gets a concussion, can't testify at Benghazi, has to be delayed. She, in 2013, she needs the special lenses on her glasses to testify because of dizziness. February of this year, falls, walking up the stairs. Recently, the coughing fits, the campaign. She Can I add one other thing? Yeah. Um, when she did her interview with the FBI and we got that information, she actually said that she couldn't remember several remember. times. So you think you can add I'm, one more? I'm there. getting to that. We're Here was reaction. Fox News contributors Ebony Williams and the host of Justice, Judge Janine Pirro. Okay, well, first of all, she didn't wipe it clean with a cloth. She used bleach pit. Uh, <laughs> if that doesn't prove criminal intent, I don't know. By the way, it wasn't one device. We now find out it's 13, 13. to 14 devices. Yes. Okay. Uh, and they smashed them with a hammer. Mm -hmm. How did James Comey not come up with an indictment here? You know, uh, as you know, Jim is a friend of mine, or was when I was the DA. I have never been more disgusted with someone who was a former prosecutor and the way he has covered this up and gone to such great lengths to, to protect, protect the woman. But he did say there's more to come. And I think we have to pay attention to that. That's very important. Chaffetz says that after reviewing documents released on Friday by FBI Director James Comey, he believes there may be evidence of, quote, obstruction of justice and destruction of evidence by Secretary Clinton and her employees and contractors. House Republicans say despite the emails being under subpoena, a new round of deleting begins, including the use of a computer shredding program. In a letter to the U.S. Attorney for D.C., Chaffetz writes, quoting, the department should investigate and determine whether Secretary Clinton or her employees and contractors violated statutes that prohibit destruction of records and concealment or cover-up of evidence material to a congressional investigation. Here's the very, very troubling news. We learned this on Friday. We learned this from the FBI. Mm -hmm. The FBI knew that, that uh, servers were wiped clean, that Blackberries were smashed and destroyed, and that a laptop was lost in the U.S. mail. The FBI ought to have pursued Mrs. Clinton and her, the people around her for obstruction of justice, and it did not do so. That is exceptionally distressing. The case against her for failure to secure state secrets is overwhelming. Now the case against somebody, we don't know who, for obstruction of justice is overwhelming, and Megan, the FBI has done nothing. Someone, somewhere, it must be the White House, has restrained the FBI from doing its job. I want to understand from each of you what it is you think that Congress should not see. See, I believe passionately in the role of Congress. I believe passionately in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. We were founded in 1814. Every expenditure, everything we do in this Congress, or everything we do in this nation is supposed to be overseen by us. We can investigate anything at any time. That's what's different about the United States of America. We're different because we are self-critical. We do go look under the hood. We do, do hold people accountable. That's why when Abraham Lincoln joined the United States Congress, he was on this committee. And he peppered the, the president because he didn't believe that the Mexican-American War started as the president said it was. And there's been a rich history of that throughout generations. We can't do that. When each of the agencies that you all represent decide that, well, we're just going to show you the relevant information. We're not even going to answer your questions. You can't see those documents. That's the way a banana republic acts. It's not the way the United States of America acts. So we expect better. And we expect you to be responsive. And I don't expect to have to issue a subpoena to see unclassified information. Some of you, I had to threaten to send a subpoena just to get you to appear today. We did some, uh, did some math. We got 70 of you sitting here. Between your compensation and your benefits package, you make more than a million dollars from taxpayers. Taxpayers are paying you seven more than a million dollars. And you won't even come talk to Congress. What do you do all day if you don't talk to Congress? What is it that you believe we don't have the right to see? 
See, this is the way our, our government works. We get to do oversight. That's why since 1814, this committee has been doing that. There's executive privilege. Let me help you. There's executive privilege. Has the president invoked executive privilege in this case? No. The answer is no. Good. That's right. The answer is no. Is there any other situation? Look, when it comes to classified information and the classification that, that deals in the executive order, you know, not all the information that we have in our files belongs to us. We defer to other agencies when it comes to access to their classified information. But you are the ones that put redactions on personal identifiable information, correct? We did on the personal identifiable information, that's correct. Where in the Constitution does it say that I can't see that? It doesn't address it specifically in the Constitution. Here, here's the problem. You handpicked the 302s to give to us, but the reality is... You should give us all the 302s. So let me say this. I think that uh, I think the director made principal decisions about what to say to Congress when he was here and also what to provide to Congress. As far as the... the Wait, where do I find that? Personally identified. Do we just let everybody in government decide that they're based on their own individual principles? That's what Congress... See, it's trust but verify is how it works. You don't get to decide what I get to see. I get to see it all. Will the FBI provide to Congress the full file with no redactions of personal identifiable information? I cannot make that commitment sitting here today. Then I'm going to issue a subpoena, and I'm going to do it right now. So let's go. I've signed this subpoena. We want all the 302s, and we would like the full file. You can accept service on behalf of the FBI? Certainly. You are hereby served. You understand why Congress might want to know whether or not the attorney-client privilege was waived and who the client was? I can, I can certainly imagine. Yeah, me too. That's why we want to see the file, agent. I mean, you say it's unprecedented. Mr. Cummings used to be a criminal defense attorney. He got to see all your 302s. Ken Buck used to be an assistant United States attorney. He got to see all your 302s. Probation officers get to see all your 302s. Why can't Congress? So I think we've given you the, the, the relevant ones as we... If we if we've relevant according to whom? I am telling you, I don't think you've given me all the relevant 302s. Well, the, rema the remainder of the 302s will come out through the FOIA process. I, but, 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 but since when did Congress have to go through FOIA? Normally this happens when the FBI serves a subpoena. So that means but now it's, it's been happen. served on them. That means it's not going to happen until after the election. I, this is going to take a long time. Uh, you know, there are judges sitting in, a, in an emergent capacity for applications like this. I wouldn't be surprised if it's resolved by the end of this week. Whoa. Wow. In the world did she take that form that she was given, right. read through it and sign it, put her name on it and say, I fully understand my responsibility to handle classified documents and not get indicted. The form of which you speak followed a two and a half hour tutorial given to her on day one as Secretary of State by two FBI agents in which they went through line by line the obligation of the Secretary of State yeah. to recognize state secrets, confidential secret or top secret, those Basic are the three stuff. marking, when she sees them, whether they're stamped with that marking or not. At the end of that tutorial, she signs this very, very detailed pledge. Yes promising and swearing that she understands her obligation is to recognize these secrets. That obligation was violated hundreds of times. The statement we just showed that she said on the plane right. is 180 degrees from what the FBI says she right. told her. So the big overarching question is, and I said, how did she not get indicted? Is any of this a legal problem for her? It or is would, it just it, well, bad judgment? This is a legal problem for her if Donald Trump becomes president and, and decides he wants to seek, uh, his, his attorney general decides he wants to seek an indictment. You, your thoughts. Thanks, Megan. Well, you did a very good job there of setting forth just how uh, Comey's statement just blew up this tissue of lies that has been told by Secretary Clinton throughout this case. Um, ending, of course, with his conclusion that while, as he put it at one point, um, there is evidence of potential violations of the statutes regarding the handling of classified information, then he goes on to say our judgment is that no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. So he, he didn't really find necessarily that she hadn't committed a crime. Uh, he just said that he didn't think it was a crime that should be prosecuted, which is a different matter entirely, and goes well beyond what, my, what one might have expected an FBI director to recommend to the department, perhaps, or to say publicly, which makes this whole um, uh, uh,
procedure today, more than a little unusual, Megan, because if you think about it, if he didn't think it was worth prosecuting, all he had to do, when you think about it, is simply turn over his findings to the Department of Justice and leave it to the, pro the Department of Justice to make what he described as a prosecutive decision. Mm -hmm. uh, he declined to do that. In fact, I think what he probably thought, Megan, was that if he did that, there wasn't any chance that the department would, would bring charges. And if you start thinking about the Obama Justice Department with Loretta Lynch at its head, formerly headed, headed by, uh, by, uh, by Eric, uh, Holder. Eric Holder, the most, the most credible person in the whole place that anybody's ever heard of is James Comey of mm -hmm. the FBI. Mm -hmm. And it's not too much to suggest here, it seems to me, Megan, that he has placed his credibility at the service of what he knew would be the ultimate outcome of this case once it was referred to the Justice Department. I mean, basically what he said is she, she did everything short of a crime and then lied about it all the way. While so she was think, being investigated. I don't know if she lied to him, but she repeatedly told the American people a bunch of nonsense. Well, that's true. There is evidence that they were extremely careless in their handling of very sensitive, highly classified information. We also assess that Secretary Clinton's use of a personal email domain was both known by a large number of people and readily apparent. Secretary Clinton said there was nothing marked classified on her emails either sent or received. Was that true? That's not true. There were a small number of portion markings on, I think, three of the documents. Secretary three, Clinton three, said, three, I did three, not three, email any classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material. Was that true? Uh, there was classified material emailed. Secretary Clinton said she used just one device. Was that true? She used multiple devices during the four years uh, of her term as Secretary of State. Secretary Clinton said all work-related emails were returned to the State Department. Was that true? No, we found work-related emails, thousands, that were not returned. Secretary Clinton said her lawyers read every one of the emails and were overly inclusive. Did her lawyers read the email content individually? No. Clinton told FBI agents she could not recall when she got a security clearance. Clinton could not recall briefings or training on the handling of classified information. And Clinton could not recall specialized training for the U.S. government's most closely held secrets, known as special access programs. But the same week Clinton became Secretary of State, she signed two non-disclosure agreements where she said she knew the rules and that violating these agreements could result in criminal charges. Clinton also told the FBI that she could not recall the details surrounding the 2009 setup of the ClintonEmail.com domain, whose servers were housed at their Chappaqua, New York home. Clinton said the personal email account was a matter of convenience. It was implausible, not someone with her background, experience, training. She's an attorney, 25 years in government, and suddenly she has selective amnesia. It's not plausible. It's not believable. We're well, here with reaction from a Republican presidential candidates, Governor Mike Huckabee of Arkansas and Dr. Ben Carson. It is great to see you both. Dr. Carson, first to you. This is kind of definitive then. Hillary Clinton says, I didn't know the rules. That's not a plausible explanation, is it? Uh, it's not a plausible explanation, and her failure to remember anything uh, certainly is not a quality that you would want to see in a president. So I'm assuming you buy it then. Do you think she wasn't capable of remembering the most basic rules on handling classified material? Well, it, it doesn't particularly matter. If she wasn't capable of remembering that, she definitely would not be capable of performing the duties of the president. And if she is lying about it, then that disqualifies her too. I think she's disqualified either way you look at it. So, Gov Governor Huckabee, just take three steps back. We're finding out about this from the FBI on the afternoon of Labor Day weekend, on a Friday, on a holiday weekend. This is a classic way to bury news that you think is going to be damaging to the principal. The FBI is not a political organization, but this move suggests they're acting for political reasons. Do you think that's true? And if so, how discouraging is that for a law enforcement agency to help a political campaign? Well, the FBI has always been above and beyond the political ramifications. It's one of the reasons that most Americans have an incredibly high respect for the FBI. This hurts the FBI's reputation, hurts James Comey's reputation, but most of all, it damages Hillary Clinton. I mean, for her to claim that she has less memory about what she was briefed on than Jason Bourne knew about his past identity is just not realistic. And I agree with Ben Carson. If she really doesn't remember fundamental facts of national security like this, that she has no business being sworn in as president, and we need to make sure the American people 
don't make what could be an incredibly irrevocable mistake. So, Dr. Carson, these 60 pages suggest more stories to come in this way. You have Hillary Clinton in the FBI's account losing somehow 13 different PDAs, some cell phones. You have her using her device in foreign countries. You have her with a skiff, which is a, supposed to be a bug-proof room in her house and office that is not secure. This suggests that she was more vulnerable even than we knew to attacks by foreign intelligence agencies. Do you think we're going to be hearing that story before Election Day? Uh, I hope so, but here's the other thing that we have to consider. Because she had such vital information in such insecure places, uh, I think probably the, the, Jap the, the Chinese, the Russians, and some others probably have some of that information. Now, what would it be like to have a president who could be blackmailed by other nations because they have information that she doesn't want to come out? Well, that is the question. That is absolutely the question. And I think it's a, ma it's a major concern for the intelligence agencies in this country. Governor Huckabee, Tell us, I mean, you, of course, are from Arkansas. You were three-term governor of Arkansas. You know the Clintons very well. They're smart people. They try to cover all the bases. They're paranoid. They're aware of their public perception. Why would Mrs. Clinton behave in a manner this reckless? Why, what would motivate her to do that? Because for so long, Tucker, uh, she and her husband have gotten away with uh, living by a different set of rules than everybody else. Uh, you know, we remember back in 2008, the uh, big banks were protected because they were too big to fail. And I think what we have is a Hillary Clinton who thinks she's too big to jail. She thinks that these rules that apply to everybody else in government are, are for them, for the little people. I saw that Hillary Clinton is featured in the upcoming issue of Women's Health magazine. <laughs> Well, next month she'll be featured in Bad Timing magazine. No, a, women's Health, famously. <laughs> oh, a disaster. Uh. That is, these emails are now confirming precisely that. Look, the Clinton Foundation is playing a major role in Hillary Clinton's State Department determining which foreign official she's meeting with, you know, who is going to have her ear or senior policymakers' ears on policy. And these are not, you know, just American corporations. These are foreign oligarchs who have their own agendas. Gilbert Chigori being an example. Why this guy, who is connected with a movement in Lebanon that is allied with Hezbollah, that was on the national federal do not uh, fly list in the United States is being given access to top decision makers at the State Department by Doug Band of the Clinton Foundation is beyond me and it's evidence of this play to pay well, corruption. But, but you got this guy Doug Band who works for the Clinton Foundation while Hillary's Secretary of State he makes the entree to Uma Abedin, Cheryl Mills and it seems that every time he does that the connection is made for the people that gave money over half the meeting she had with private citizens are people that donated or pledged to donate. Well, that sounds like she's selling out her office. Hostile foreign actors gained access to the personal email accounts of individuals with whom Clinton was in regular contact and in doing so obtained emails sent to or received by Clinton on her personal account. Hillary Clinton staff deleted and digitally bleached, which is acid cleaned, her emails after receiving a congressional subpoena. She couldn't even remember whether she was trained or handling classified information. Didn't remember anything about it. So if she really didn't remember, that's a problem. And if she did remember, that's a problem. So let's ask it, Hillary Clinton, as an inept negotiator of the worst nuclear arms deal in American history, is she guilty or not guilty? Next. Oh, believe me, we're not done yet. The indictment is hardly complete. Next, let's go to Russia. She went to the Kremlin on her very first visit and gave them that stupid symbolic reset button. You know what I think that button should have read? It should have read delete. You know, she's very good at that, by the way. And it should have read delete because she deleted in four years 
the safety and security it took us to build in 40 years. Now finally, finally here at home in one of her first decisions as Secretary of State, she set up a private email server in her basement in violation of our national security. Let's face the facts. Hillary Clinton cared more about protecting her own secrets than she cared about protecting America's secrets. And then she lied about it over and over and over again. She said there was no marked classified information on her server. The FBI director said that's untrue. She said that she did not email any classified information. The FBI director says that's untrue. She said all work-related emails were sent back to the State Department. The FBI director said that's not true. So, as to Hillary Clinton, the charge of putting herself ahead of America, guilty or not guilty? Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? Tonight, what if the Constitution no longer applied? What if the whole purpose of the Constitution was to limit the government? What if Congress's enumerated powers in the Constitution no longer limited Congress, but were actually used as a justification to extend Congress's authority over every realm of human life? What if the president, meant to be an equal to Congress, has instead become a democratically elected term-limited monarch? What if the president assumed that everything he did was legal just because he's the president? What if he could interrupt your regularly scheduled radio and TV programming for a special message from him? What if he could declare war on his own? What if he could read your emails and your texts without a search warrant? What if he could kill you without warning? What if Supreme Court justices no longer looked to the Constitution to determine the constitutionality of a law, but rather simply to what justices who preceded them thought about it? What if the rights and principles guaranteed in the Constitution have been so distorted in the past 200 years as to be unrecognizable by the founders? What if the 50 states were no longer sovereign entities, equals to each other, and parents of the federal government they voluntarily constituted? What if the states were mere provinces of a totally nationalized and fully centralized government? What if the Constitution was amended stealthily, not by constitutional amendments duly ratified by the states, but by the constant and persistent expansion of the federal government's role in our lives? What if the federal government decided if its own powers were proper and constitutional? What if the Constitution were no longer the supreme law of the land? What if you needed a license from the government to speak, to assemble, or to protest against the government? What if the government didn't like what you planned to say and so it didn't give you the license? What if the right to keep and bear arms only applied to the government? What if posse comitatus, the federal law that prohibits our military from occupying our streets, were no longer in effect? What if the government considered the military an adequate dispenser of domestic law enforcement? What if cops looked and acted like troops and you couldn't distinguish the military from the police? What if you were not secure in your person, in your papers, and in your property? What if federal agents could write their own search warrants in defiance of the Constitution? What if the government could decide when you were and were not entitled to a jury trial? What if the government could take your property whenever it wanted? What if the government could continue prosecuting you until it got the verdict it wanted? What if the government could force you to testify against yourself simply by labeling you a domestic terrorist? What if the government could torture you until you said what the government wanted to hear? What if people running for president actually supported torture? What if the government tortured your children to get to you? What if government judges and government lawyers intimidated juries into convicting the innocent? What if the government could send you to your death and your innocence meant nothing so long as the government's procedures were followed? What if America's prison population, the largest in the world, was a cruel and unusual way for a country to be free? What if half the prison population never harmed anyone but themselves? What if the people had no rights except those the government chose to let them have? What if the states had no rights except to do as the federal government commanded? What if our elected officials didn't really live among us, but instead all had their hearts and homes in Washington, D.C.? 
What if the government could strip you of your rights because of where your mother was when you were born? What if the income tax was unconstitutional? What if the states were convinced to give up their representation in Congress? What if the government tried to ban you from using a substance in your body that is older than the government itself? What if voting didn't mean anything anymore because both political parties stand for big government? What if the government could write any law, regulate any behavior, and tax any event? The Constitution be damned. What if the government was the reason we don't have a Constitution anymore? What if you could love your country but hate what the government has done to it? What if sometimes to love your country you had to alter or abolish the government? What if Jefferson was right? What if that government is best which governs least? What if I'm right? What if the government is wrong? What if it is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong? What if it is better to perish fighting for freedom than to live as a slave? What if freedom's greatest hour of danger is now?